looking a little bit at, at Solomon, uh, both uh, this morning and this afternoon. Um, and uh, as we uh, read the, the scriptures uh, uh, this morning, we saw that uh, uh, Solomon at the beginning of his uh, reign, at the beginning of, of, of taking over uh, the role of being king uh, from his father, uh, had a very humble uh, prayer. He had an encounter with God that we read about there. Um, it's interesting that uh, in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Holy Spirit uh, like we have today. They didn't have the gift of the Holy Spirit upon all the believers. And uh, um, so God would, would appear uh, to, to different men at different times, and he would send his spirit upon them, certainly, as uh, Solomon was, was one who, who wrote a lot of uh, books in the Old Testament. He wrote a lot of the Proverbs for us, the Song of Solomon, Ecclesiastes, and so forth. And I believe the spirit of God was upon him as he did that, because we're told later that, uh, that God, all of God's word was inspired uh, by God, was given to, to Solomon to write. And, uh, and yet, uh, in those times, too, uh, God only appeared uh, to Solomon uh, twice in his life. Once here at the beginning in chapter 3, and then again in, in chapter 9 after they uh, had completed the building of the temple. Uh, but in between then, uh, you know, God didn't appear to him. And I, I think about the Old Testament men and how difficult uh, sometimes that must have been to be the only one, you know, and to... Uh, uh, to, to, to go uh, perhaps uh, a long time, days, uh, months perhaps of not hearing from the Lord and, and yet they were faithful in carrying out uh, what, what God had said. And even though they were uh, uh, sinful men just as we are today, uh, they still uh, walked uh, closely with the Lord as, as, as they could. And we'll see uh, Solomon certainly started out very well in his walk with the Lord. Um, unfortunately, he didn't... Uh, finish his entire life uh, close to the Lord. So um, he, he had gotten a, away uh, from, from the Lord. He had, he had been distracted uh, from the truth of God's word. And uh, that happens uh, to men today. It happens to people today. And, and that's why it's so important that we stay uh, focused and, and close uh, to God through his word so we can learn uh, from these examples. That was something that uh, Paul, uh, in his writings, uh, instructed us, that these are, are examples to us, uh, although we have to be a little bit careful when we look at the, the examples in the Old Testament because you have to realize they didn't have the spirit of God like we have today. Uh, they didn't certainly didn't have the word of God like we have today, and, and how difficult that must have been uh, for Solomon to... Um, you know, they had the book of the law, but they didn't have a lot of copies of it. It wasn't something that they could give out to everybody. Uh, they had to hand write those things. And, uh, and so to, to not have uh, God's word like, like we have it today, like we depend upon today, uh, just must have been uh, a difficult uh, time uh, to live in. And that's why I would never want to give that up. You know, I never want to go back and, and, uh, and live, uh, excuse me, in, in those times just because I don't want to give up what I've got. Um, uh, here in, in uh, um, the, the, the book of uh, 1 Kings and, and, and in chapter 3, um, uh, it, 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 we learn that it always pleases God when we ask uh, and we seek um, uh, his uh, understanding, when we seek after his discretion of what is right and what is wrong. You know, too many times uh, we go seeking uh, to find out what's right and what's wrong from somebody else. You know, we, we, we depend on ourselves or we, uh, today uh, we have uh, uh, all sorts of media that we can uh, listen to or, or go read at and, and we're always trying to find out seeking understanding and discernment uh, from those sources when, when God is, is clearly uh, showing us that uh, it pleases him when we, when, we, when we come to him for that understanding and that, uh, and that discernment. And, you know, that, that was true for Solomon in Solomon's day, but it's also true for us in, in today's world. That, that was the example uh, that, that God uh, gave to us, and I believe that that is uh, the 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 crux of, of this portion of scripture is how important it is for us to seek God for uh, that discernment and to seek God for, for his understanding. Uh, and we can only do that by, by reading his word. 
You know, if, if we never read his read word, we never stay uh, close to him in his word, we'll never know what the truth is. And uh, uh, I spent a little time uh, this morning in, in a Sunday school class, and we were looking at where Jesus uh, uh, recorded that, that he is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man cometh unto the Father but by him. And we need to uh, seek after him just as, as Solomon uh, sought after uh, the Lord. You know, Solomon had, uh, here in this account, had some big shoes to fill. His father, uh, King David, uh, had, had uh, served the Lord God. Now, now his father wasn't perfect. His father was not uh, a sinless man. He was, he was not uh, immortal in any means. He was, he was a, a man uh, and, and sought after the, the passions like, uh, like men do today. And, uh, and he sinned in those things. But, you know, he never went against, he never uh, worshipped any other God but the Lord God. And God blessed him for that. God, he, he was chosen uh, by God just as, uh, as, as uh, the Lord uh, provides for us the salvation today. So there are, uh, uh, there are uh, examples in this and there are uh, themes in this that we can draw in, into our lives uh, today. And Solomon had, in this account, had just become king and uh, was now uh, kind of uh, humbled by the task that was before him. Uh, he knew he had big shoes to fill. He knew that he had a lot uh, uh, to, to do, and yet uh, he uh, was uh, unsure of himself, as we can read in this. And, you know, sometimes we can be unsure about ourselves, and that's okay, as long as we get our surety and our, and our, and our uh, uh, confidence in God. And that's one thing Solomon did have. He had his confidence uh, based in God. That was something that his father had taught him. <clears throat> and here, uh, the Lord appears uh, to, Gibeon, or to uh, uh, Solomon in Gibeon. And uh, he appears to him at night. And uh, it was a vision that he had as we, as we read through this. But it was the Lord that, that spoke unto him. And, uh, and if we read, uh, we see uh, Solomon's response to that was one of humility. And that is something that we can learn uh, from as well. If you look at verse uh, 6 with me out of uh, 1 Kings chapter 3. It says, And Solomon said, Thou hast shown unto thy servant David, my father, great mercy, according as he walked before thee in truth, and in righteousness, in uprightness of heart with thee, and thou hast kept for him this great kindness, that thou hast given him a son to sit on his throne as it is this day. Alan, would you open up some prayer? There you sitting on the wrong side. I'm usually sitting, you know, sitting over here. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so, so when we uh, are looking at this in, in verse 6, uh, um, Solomon is, is understanding that it's not because of anything of, of who he is, why he's given this privilege. Uh, it, it's really based on uh, God's uh, blessing on David. He recognizes that, uh, that it was a, a, a promise that he had given to his father was the reason why he had the privilege of being uh, uh, king. It wasn't anything that any, any of the, the qualities that he possessed other than those qualities that God gave to him as a result of his, God's faithfulness to his father David. You know, sometimes I, I think we, uh, we take uh, a little bit too much credit for what God allows us to do. And, and I'm, you know, as we see uh, uh, Solomon here uh, in his uh, first statement, he, he is recognizing that it is God's mercy and his greatness uh, that he has shown to his father. And that's why he has the opportunity uh, to, to uh, sit on this, on this throne. Um, and he also recognized that his father needed God's great mercy. So he knew what the, the sins of the, his father, his father had committed. They were, they were uh, uh, nothing that was, that was hidden. It wasn't hidden from him. And it wasn't hidden uh, from us in, in God's word today. And it was only by God's great mercy uh, that his father 
was able to be king at all. As a matter of fact, it was only by God's great mercy that, that David was able to even live. Because for a while in David's life, uh, you remember uh, King Saul was after him. He wanted to kill him. And if it wasn't God's mercy that was shown upon David, he would have never survived that. Uh, he would have never survived that. And it wasn't just one attack. It, was, it carried on for, uh, for a significant period of time where Saul was, was seeking to kill him. He recognized that there were conditions on God's mercy as well. As long as he uh, walked uh, before the Lord in truth, in righteousness, and with the uprightness in heart towards God. Those were the conditions that God had put on, 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 on David, and now those were the conditions that God was going to put on Solomon as king. It was important uh, that, that Solomon uh, did this. It was important for the, uh, the, the nation of Israel to do this because it was a way of, of being a witness to the other nations that there was only one almighty God. All the other nations had several gods that they worshipped, but, but God brought this nation together. He brought this nation out of Egypt, out of bondage, and he gave them a promise and then he fulfilled that promise by bringing them here to the promised land. And now it was up to uh, first uh, King David and now King Solomon uh, to walk in that truth, to walk in that righteousness, and to uh, walk in the uprightness of heart with God. Solomon recognized that uh, his position didn't so much depend on him as much as it depended upon God. He recognized that uh, the opportunity that he had before him uh, was one that was blessed of God, it was one that was given to him by God. And that's the same, same thing we have for us. Whatever our, our, our abilities are, whatever our roles are in our lives, we have to recognize it. it's because of, of God's blessing us in, in providing that to, to us. Uh, Solomon was becoming king because God, through his great mercy and his kindness. You know, that's one thing. We uh, sometimes, uh, it, it, we, we know how great God is and we, and we sing how great God is. I was thankful for the, uh, for the songs of how holy, singing uh, how holy God is. Uh, but God has many attributes. And they're all infinite in their extent. And one of those attributes is his kindness towards his people. And, and, and so uh, um, Solomon here recognizes that it was because of God's great kindness towards his father that he was given this opportunity. Now, something to remember, David wasn't the first one to have had this opportunity. Remember, King Saul also had this opportunity, didn't he? He was given, King Saul was the, was the king of Israel before David. He was the one that, was, that had a son, right? And, and it, was in, it was given to, to King Saul. He had that opportunity if he walked in that righteous heart, in the uprightness of his heart, if he walked after truth and after that righteousness, he would have been in that, that situation and would have handed the kingdom to his son, Jonathan. The problem was King Saul didn't do that, did he? He didn't fulfill that opportunity that he had. And to put it in our, in our language today, he, he blew it. <laughs> right? He just flat out blew it. And it cost not only King Saul his life, but it also cost his son Jonathan his life, as we read that account as well. So I think that was... Uh, weighing on Solomon's mind as, as he was contemplating this as well, that, that this was a great responsibility that he had to fulfill the calling that God had given to him. See, as children of God, and in particular as the, as the body of Christ, and, and even, even more specifically as, as Fellowship Baptist Church, we are assembled here because God has fulfilled his promise to us. He's fulfilled uh, his promise to us through, through Jesus Christ and, and what he did for us for our salvation. But he's also given us a promise here as a church that if we seek after him, he will be found. 
Right? He's given us uh, uh, a, a greatness. Now, if we were choosing up who sides on a, on a team, we probably wouldn't choose the, the people that are here. Right? Uh, but God has made that choice. He's drawn us here, and we need to be thankful uh, to him for that. Solomon understood that he was in the midst of a great people. You know, sometimes I think we forget we're in the midst of a great people. And we need to remember that, uh, that, that what we are about, we're not about what we want, we're about what, what God has given to us. It's not anything that we have done, but it's only by God's great mercy that he has allowed us to even assemble together. He's given us a building to be in. He's given us uh, lights, heat this morning, probably air conditioning this afternoon. You know. He's given that uh, to us, and we need to be grateful to him uh, for that. But you know, the same thing applies as we, as, we, as we look at that. We need to realize we better not blow it. Right? <laughs> we have the example of, of, of Saul. We need to carry that forward. We need to uh, stay true in the same way, the same truths that Solomon is, is praying unto God. We need to uh, remain uh, uh, in, in, in Jesus' truth, the truth of the gospel. We need to remain righteous uh, according to God's word, and, and we also need to walk in uprightness of heart, not just because we're proud of one another, but because we have a, a gospel to, to carry out to the city of Augusta and in the, in the surrounding towns. We need to also understand that David wasn't perfect. Solomon wasn't perfect. Neither was Moses, nor was Abraham, nor was any of the other people that God used in any of the Old Testament things. We need to realize we're not perfect either, but God can still use us if we have a humble heart. Right? That is, we need to humble ourselves before the Lord, just as Solomon has done here, and seek after him. They all needed a, a, a savior. They all needed the great mercy of God. And we do too. There is nobody that, hasn't, that, that doesn't need that. Every one of us do. And we need to be uh, uh, patient with one another. We need to have the kindness that, that God has given to us. We need to show that towards one another. But you see, we're not just saved and, and brought together as, a, as an assembly here to just sit here. We have work to do. Just as Solomon was, was uh, kind of uh, coming to grips with, with the, the work that was uh, the insurmountable work that was before him, sometimes that, that is overwhelming to us too, thinking that we have this, this, this great heritage that we have received and now it's up to us to, to provide it for the next generation. That can be overwhelming to us and we, can be, we, we need to be careful that we don't start doing things uh, by our own wisdom but that we seek after God's counsel and how to do that. We need to seek after uh, God's wisdom. We need to seek under, after God's understanding. And remember, when we do that, God is pleased with that. What he gets displeased with is when we start doing things in our own will, in our own way, and we, in our own wisdom. And we try to, try to uh, uh, manipulate things instead of just serving the Lord where he's given to us. <clears throat> See, we're not saved by our works, but we are saved unto works. And each one of us has a role as, as a member here uh, to, to fulfill as God leads us in that. Notice what Solomon understands in verse 7. He says, And now, Lord my God, thou hast made thy servant king instead of David thy father. And I am but a little child. I know not how to go out or come in. I find that interesting, a very humble statement by a king. He says, I don't even know how to go out or to come in. Now, I'm sure he had people to help him figure that out. <laughs> you know, I can kind of... Uh, uh, some, you know, just, just looking at some of the pageantry on some of these kings and things and, and, and you know, when they were supposed to do this or to do that, it must, you, know, you can get all caught up in that. But I don't think that's what Solomon was getting caught up in. He was getting caught up in, Lord, I don't know how to do this job that my father did. 
I don't know, I don't know how he made those decisions uh, that he had to make and, and how he did that other than through your great mercy. And that's what he is seeking is, is that because he knows how much now, how little he does know in, in, in comparison to the task that was before him. And he was going to need that. And he says, in, in comparison to all of my responsibilities, man, I don't even know how to go out or come in. He, says, he, he was very humble in his heart here. See, once we are saved, we must continue to rely on God's mercy. It isn't something that we just rely on for our salvation and then leave behind, but it's something that we continue to rely on. We continue to, to call on. We continue to rely on his knowledge and his understanding. We continue to rely on his counsel. Remember, you know, one of the, one of the uh, 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 titles that was given Jesus was Wonderful Counselor, right? Well, how many times do we seek after him for counsel? Or do we just go off and do things on our own? We need to remember that we have a wonderful counselor that wants us to come before him. This is kind of a hard lesson for us. As human beings, we like to do things ourselves. And, you know, it, it's amazing that uh, we, we get caught up in that because we get a little bit of understanding that God gives to us, and we think now we know everything. <laughs> right? And we start marching down the road like we know what God wants. And pretty soon, it gets flipped around. Well, we're counseling God about what his word says. Well, that's a dangerous place to be in. When we have to tell God what we think his word says, we, we better stop. <laughs> better stop, because that's exactly the place that Saul was in. When he was trying to explain to, 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 to God why he did things and what, what he was doing, he was trying to make up all sorts of excuses. And what he found himself in was a situation where he was counseling God and God's people. It didn't go well for him. It doesn't go well for us. We need to seek counsel of God. And I'll tell you, he will provide it. He promised us that if we ask him for wisdom... He'll provide it to us. Now, he'll provide it in his time. <laughs> That's the other thing we don't like to wait for, is his timing. <laughs> we want things, uh, I, I know I've got something to do next Friday, so I want the wisdom to be able to do it today, so that way I'll know what to do next Friday. No, God doesn't work that way. <laughs> he provides us that wisdom at the moment that we need it because he wants us to rely on him. If he gave us that wisdom today for the things that we need to do next Friday, we wouldn't, we'd stop relying on him. And we rely on our own wisdom. We rely on ourselves. And that only gets us into trouble. So sometimes God is protecting us from ourselves when he, when he waits on that, on that wisdom. You know, it, there are many examples in God's word where, where uh People had to rely on God's counsel. They, they didn't understand what the situation they were going through. You know, we, we read one of those accounts last Sunday in, in the book of Ruth, where you know, we, it wasn't really until the end where you got to see what the purpose of it was. But during going through that, it was, a, was, a, was a very trying time. Right? Uh, another example that, that, I, that I look at uh, in God's word is Job. You know, he, he was going through all of these difficult times not knowing uh, what it was. And, and, boy, his group of counselors weren't very comforting to him. <laughs> and even when God spoke at the end, God wasn't exactly comforting to him. <laughs> God was reminding Job who God was. And it was God who was sovereign, not Job, right? Here, Solomon understands that God is sovereign, and he needs God's mercy upon him. Notice verse 8. It says, And thy servant is in the midst of thy people, which thou hast chosen a great people that cannot be numbered nor counted for the multitude. This 
kind of reminds me a little bit of the passage Rich uh, had on uh, Wednesday night out of Romans chapter 12, where uh, Paul talks about the great cloud of witnesses were compassed about. Solomon knew that he was compassed about with this great people. And it wasn't just, were, were they perfect people? Absolutely not. but they were a great people that God had chosen. It was a great people because of who their God was. It's the same thing we need to understand. We're we're great not because of who we are, but because of who our God is. See, we are part of a great group of believers. The thing we need to understand is we need to be careful about that. Because if we all of a sudden start gossiping or complaining or murmuring about that great group of people, we find ourselves in the situation where we're trying to counsel God as to who his people should be. It's not a good place to be in whenever we're providing counsel to God. We need to take God's counsel. We need to seek the same thing that Solomon sought. If we read in verse 9, it says, there, Give therefore thy servant an understanding heart. Well, that's the first thing we need to pray for, an understanding heart. Now, if we don't have the understanding of who God is, that's the first thing we need to pray for. Who, God, who are you, and who am I? And God will reveal that the truth of, uh, uh, of who God is, and he'll reveal the truth of who we are by showing us our need of salvation. That's the first step of understanding that we need. He goes on, he says, so that, uh, uh, excuse me, an understanding heart to judge thy people that I may discern between good and bad. Boy, that's, that's discernment we need today. Right? He goes on, he says, who is able to judge this so, uh, great, so great a, a people? And the speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked for this thing. And God said unto him, Because thou had asked this thing and hast not asked for thyself long life, neither hast thou asked riches for thyself, nor hast asked uh, the life of, thy, uh, of thine enemies, but hast asked for thyself understanding to discern judgment. I get to thinking about what we pray for. And I begin to think, how often do we pray for our health and our long life and, and, and our provisions for um, either uh, pains or, or, or things that, that, we're, that we have that, that we are supposed to bring before the Lord? But is that all that we pray for? Right? Do we pray for our riches and by that, I mean our bills that we've gotten ourselves into or, or our possessions that we would like to have or our clothing or, or all of these things that we want. We get caught up in praying for those things and we leave out the important part. Sometimes we spend more time praying about our enemies. Lord, straighten them out. Lord, help them to do this, help them to do that. Lord, change this, change that. Instead of Praying to the Lord to give us discernment about the Lord changing our heart towards other people. Do we spend the majority of our time in prayer on those things instead of praying for discernment and understanding that, that comes from God? That tells us a little bit about where, where, where our hearts. That, that opens that up a little bit to us. See, Solomon in this uh, period of time. He, he could have asked for all those things, but he didn't. And the Lord was pleased with that. And then the Lord provided uh, that to him anyway. And that, as I was thinking about, reminds me a little bit of, of the teaching of Jesus. He, 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 at one point in his Matthew chapter 6, was saying, you know, uh, seek first the kingdom of God in all of his righteousness, and then all those other things will be added to you. Solomon's our example of that. He sought those things first, and then God added the other things uh, in behind it. I just want to turn over to uh, Philippians chapter 2 for a moment, just to uh, 
bring a little bit of, of uh, a New Testament tie-in to what we're reading here in the Old Testament. It's always important to do that, and you always find uh, a way to do that in, in the studying of, of God. But Philippians chapter 2, Philippians chapter 2, and I'm going to uh, look at verse uh, 5 for a moment. It says, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. You know, just looking at that, there, there's so much just in that verse alone, but, but the first word there is to, to let it happen. Sometimes we have our mind set, and we want God to bless our set mind, rather than letting God change our mind. <laughs> As Baptists, we don't like to change anything, especially our minds. But he's, Paul is writing here, he says, the let this mind be in you which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant. You notice Solomon referred to himself as a servant. Jesus refers to himself as a servant. We are to be servants. We're to have a servant's heart towards God. We're to have a servant's heart towards one another. I remember uh, a few months ago when uh, the, the national pastors from Help Ministry was here, one of them said, you, you want to find out if you have a servant's heart? Let somebody treat you like a servant. See how you respond. <laughs> Many of us don't have a servant's heart. <laughs> but Jesus took upon the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in the fashion as a man, he humbled himself. Just, we see that example in, in, in Solomon. And became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. That was what God had given Jesus to do. Not that we would follow in his death, but we would follow in his life. See, Jesus' purpose was to die on the cross for the punishment once and for all for our sinfulness. That way we can enjoy life through Jesus. It says in verse 9, Wherefore God hath also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, and the things... <coughs> of things in heaven and things in earth and the things under the earth, that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have, already, have, ye, as ye have always obeyed, not as to my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. We're going to come back to that statement. But here... Paul is writing this letter from a distance. And he says, I'm, I'm so thankful that you're following the instruction without me having to be there to lord over you. See, God doesn't want us to do it that way. He doesn't want us to, to lord over one another. He wants us to encourage one another, to edify one another, to lift up one another. Verse 13 says, For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. It's God that's working in us. It's the only way. Solomon understood he needed God's mercy in order to fulfill his responsibility as king. We also need God's mercy to fulfill our roles as children of God. God has to work within us because if he doesn't work within us, there's no way that we're going to be able to get that done. Now, verse 14, there's where the rubber meets the road. Do all things without murmuring and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless, the sons of God, without rebuke, in the midst of a crook, crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world. That's the reason why we do this. Holding forth the word of life that, I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. Yea, if I have offered upon the sacrifice and the service of your faith, I joy 
and rejoice with you all. <laughs> Paul wasn't in, in prison. All right? He wasn't in a place that was very comforting. <laughs> Yet he's talking about joy and he's talking about rejoicing. But then verse 18, he says, For this same cause also do ye joy and rejoice with me. We're to joy and rejoice with one another. That's why we we have the time of of drawing together in the afternoon to to, to praise the Lord for what he's done for us. It's the time when we we have the opportunity in in, in Sunday school, uh, uh, oftentimes of sharing what the Lord has done for us. We're to rejoice with one another. It isn't a time that we're to be jealous of one another. It's a time that we are to be thankful for what God is doing in our midst. But first, we need to let that mind be in us. The first step in seeking God's understanding and discernment is to humble ourselves before him as a sinner who needs a savior. We need to to, uh, respond to that gift of life that God has provided for us through his son. That's the first step. It has to be that way, and then we can continue and grow in in, uh, the truth of his word. We are reminded that we are to work out our own salvation. Now, I, I struggled with that for many years until I finally realized, you know, it's kind of like exercising. You go to work out. If you don't work out, what happens? Get a little <laughs> right? We get out of shape. Well, what happens with our salvation? Our salvation gets out of shape. We, we, we get afraid to share it because we're lazy. <laughs> right? we, need, we need to work out our salvation. We need to go through and remind ourselves what God did for us and what the, the joy that that is, and then let it shine through our lives, let that joy be in us uh, that, that we can share with other people. But I tell you what, if you don't work out your salvation, you're just going to sit back and you're not going to have the strength and the faith to be able to be, have that boldness to be able to share it. Because I'll tell you what, it takes boldness in this world to, to let our light shine. This is a very dark world that we are in, but we are in the midst of it by design. It says in verse 14, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation. You don't think we are, just turn on the TV for 10 minutes. You'll find out how crooked and perverse we are. If we don't work it out, we become out of shape and weak, and then we are subject to the temptations of sin. Satan moves in real fast. He can see the weakest amongst us. He can see us in our weaknesses. If we leave that guard down, if we, if we take off uh, that, that, uh, that, that shield of faith or the breastplate of righteousness and we throw it to the side, Satan knows he's got an angle on us. Jesus reminds us that he is the way, the truth, and the life. We need to live according to that truth. We need to live according to that righteousness and according to that uprightness of heart. And according to verse 14, we're to do all things without murmurings and disputings. And we're to be blameless before God. Now that's a high calling. But God would never call us to do something that we can't do. (laughs) We can't rely on ourselves. We must rely on him for that. He has to change our minds because our minds don't naturally seek after him. We actually, we have to go through every day and confess our our sinful thoughts to him and and, and ask him to replace a heart, give us a heart that seeks after him. This morning, I just want us to consider some things. Uh, the wisdom and the understandings that we rely on. What fruit does it produce? It'll show itself and how how that happens. Does it produce 
unity and joy and rejoicing with the family? Or does it uh, result in disunity and grumblings and murmurings and, and uh, all sorts of other things that lead us away from the Lord? Does it produce a spirit of joy and rejoicing? What about our walk? Are we walking in truth and righteousness and uprightness of heart with God? What about our prayers? What do our prayers reflect about our hearts? Are we praying for uh, the, the counsel of God or are we just praying that, Lord, I just want my way and I want you to leave me alone? The other thing that I see is a servant's heart. Are we serving? Are we like Solomon that recognized, look, Lord, I'm a servant in the midst of a great people. We are in the midst of a great people, not because of who we are, but because of Christ and what he did for us. And it's not just us at Fellowship Baptist Church, but it is the body of believers around the world that are doing this. That's why it's so great to be able to uh, make connections and to talk with people uh, as we did with the national pastors who are here so we can find out that, yes, this is a great people. This is a, a, a great body that we belong to because now we know people on the other side of the world literally that we can pray for and we can encourage and we can be encouraged by. How do you view the body of Christ? Do you view it as a great people? Or is it just some group of people that you come to on Sunday morning and then shake their hand, smile at them, and walk away? <laughs> Let the Lord change your heart towards that. Donnie, would you close us in prayer?